Hi, this is Steve Warona, and you're listening to Campus Public Safety Online from the National Center for Campus Public Safety. Before I introduce today's session, here's a brief orientation to the Adobe Connect interface we're using. Your browser right now is showing the title slide for today's talk. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a box labeled Questions and Comments, where you can read and type messages. There's a tab labeled Everyone at the bottom of this box, and that's the tab you'll use for all of your general messages, including questions and comments for our speaker. We'll be breaking for discussion several times during the presentation, so please do not hold your questions to the end. If you run into technical problems, you can request help in the box labeled Type Here for Technical Help. Someone will contact you directly to help solve your problem. We're also monitoring Twitter for your questions and comments. Use hashtag NCCPSWebinar. That's NCCPSWebinar. If you missed part of today's conversation, or if you want to see some or all of it again, this webinar is being recorded and captioned. The link will be available shortly after the webinar on the NCCPS Webinars page. And watch your email for a link to a brief evaluation survey requesting your reactions and comments on today's session. Please take a minute to respond to that survey when the link arrives. We do appreciate your feedback. And now for a presentation. Jean Cleary was 19 years old in 1986 when she was raped and murdered in her college dormitory. Neither she nor her parents could have known the danger she was in because standards for campus crime reporting simply did not exist 30 years ago. What happened to Jean launched her parents on an effort to empower colleges and universities to create campuses that are safer for every student every day. The result was the Cleary Act, a consumer protection law that aims to provide transparency around campus crime policy and statistics. Today we're going to hear about the top five challenges with the Cleary Act and Title IX, a 1972 statute that rules out sex-based discrimination in educational institutions. Our speaker is Allison Kiss, Executive Director of the Cleary Center, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to guiding institutions of higher education to implement effective campus safety measures. Since joining the Cleary Center, Allison Kiss has been instrumental in the development, implementation, and instruction of curricula for institutions of higher education. For her role at the Cleary Center, Allison was Director of Wellness, Alcohol, and Drug Education at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, and she's currently enrolled in a residency doctoral program in higher education administration at Northeastern University. She has served as an expert witness in campus sexual assault civil cases and has been a contributor to major media outlets. Outside of her work with the Cleary Center, she's involved with the professional organizations that include Rapid Response Expert Network, Violence Against Women Online Resources, Expanded Partners Group, and the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. She also served as a member of the National Attorneys General Task Force on School and Campus Safety. Allison has a BA in Psychology and Spanish from the Catholic University of America and an MS in Criminal Justice from St. Joseph's University, where she completed a thesis on crisis management in secondary schools. Allison Kiss, welcome to Campus Public Safety Online. Thank you. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to spend some time with you talking about the Clear Act and Title IX and the top five challenges. And this presentation was essentially distilled from questions that we get regularly. We are um, a national nonprofit, as Steve mentioned, and we take phone calls or email inquiries on a regular basis. We also work um, with the Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women as the technical assistance provider for the Clery Act. So that's really where we get a lot of the, the questions from people regularly, and we kind of narrow down these top five topics. Everything that we do every day when we enter our office, we see Jean Cleary's picture. Um, our work is guided by what happened to Jean, and we like to think of compliance as a starting point and really something that you could build on to, with an ethic of care for your students and how you can move forward to build a safer campus environment. Um, our mission is very simple. We want to work with colleges and universities to make campuses safer, and we do that really through collecting data, uh, working with other partner organizations um, with the end goal of prevention and then also to build effective response systems. 
we believe that institutions can do this on their own. So everything that we do is a way to help institutions institutionalize compliance or build that expertise within their organization. Uh, we have a membership program that ba basically uh, combines a lot of our training and educational programs for campuses. National Campus Safety Awareness Month is September. We have free programming all throughout that month. month you can sign up on our website if you have interest. Uh, we do a lot of policy work where we help to guide or inform policy with what we've collected from institutions and other entities. And then we have Clery Act training seminars, which are, have recently been improved, where we have a workbook that now goes along with the program. So institutions not only learn about the elements of the Clery Act, but also have, have a way to, to look at how they are going to apply, apply it. So what are some of the questions that we want to answer? What are some of the things that we're looking at? So what types of incidents are reported under Clery in Title IX? who must report incidents, who can keep reports confidential, what types of services can, can be made available and identifiable uh, information can be made available. These are a lot of the questions that we hear on a regular basis when we're looking at compliance with Clery and Title IX. I think right now the landscape of policy is what's going to happen, what will happen with Title IX guidance under the Trump administration. Um, if you've been paying attention to the news lately, we know that folks within the Department of Education from Betsy DeVos to Candace Jackson are meeting with multiple constituencies in this area. And the best advice I could say is that there are existing laws. While guidance may change, we know that the laws exist. So the way I'm really framing this presentation is to think about what you can do to best serve your students and communities with the laws that exist. Um, and I'm asking you to maybe step outside of what's going on in Washington and think about how you could use what the letter of the law says to, to make campuses safer for your students. So the top five areas that we're going to focus on today are reporting, timely warning and emergency notification, confidentiality, coordinated responses, or how I put that uh, blankly is working together, and then training and education. So some of the areas to consider when we think about reporting are the types of incidents we're reporting, campus security authorities under the Clery Act, responsible employees under Title IX, and then sometimes those overlap. And then there's also state laws that come into play. And I will uh, give a plug for the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators, who provided a great um, document on state laws specific to sexual assault that kind of provides an overview of what's going on in the 50 states specific to sexual assault. We're seeing a trend right now on in different states where they're taking the issue of college to campus sexual assaults and looking at what they can do within their state, especially as you're watching what goes on in the federal level. So it's something to pay attention to if you have not already in terms of what's happening within your state around these issues. So under the Clery Act, those of you who are living and breathing Clery every day, and I had a chance to look at the attendee list, and I know we have a diverse amount of a, diverse types of attendees in terms of what your role is at your institution, um, from two year to four year to if you're a Clery coordinator or if you're working in Title IX. Um, but Clery really is an institutional obligation. So even if it's not part of your day in day out job, it's something that's important to be aware of and to know how it may affect your work. And so I've listed here what's, what are known as Cleary crimes. So when I refer to anything within this presentation as a Cleary crime, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, we know that there's the hate crimes as well, which is going to be any of the previously listed crimes as well as the addition of the four underneath. We know we have the arrests and referrals for liquor law, drug law, and weapons violations. And then also dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking which was most recently added through the Violence Against Women Act amendments to Cleary in 2013. You also know that you have to consider with Cleary geography. So those that happen in the institution's geography. The on-campus geography is probably the easiest to understand, which is going to include anything on the main campus. Then there's the non-campus. Uh, geography, which is going to be anything owned and controlled by the institution, but it's not reasonably contiguous to the main campus area or the on-campus area. And then the public property, so that's typically if there's a publicly owned street that's um, 
running through your campus or if your campus borders a federal park, for example, that's accessible to your students, that's what you're thinking of as public property. One of the questions that I saw that came in um, prior to the webinar was this one mile rule, the notion of this one mile rule within the geography. And something that's important to think about is the one mile rule in terms of being considered as on campus, really the ideology behind that from conversations with the Department of Education was if you're an institution that has residence halls or housing for students, not on campus, but within one mile of your campus, that that's going to count as your on-campus property. Um, that doesn't mean that you're, you have to count a 7-Eleven or a store um, or something that's not public property, that's private property as part of your campus. Um, I know that was a question that came up. That's the short answer for it, that the intention of the Department of Education, including that in the handbook, was to make sure that you're including those residences. They, they're finding that some campuses are buying properties for students to live in. And by not putting it as on campus, it gets out of the fire safety requirements and those pieces. So that's one thing to think about when you're thinking of that quote unquote one mile rule. Campus security authorities. So we're going to talk about, and I will reference, I'm, I'm going to talk to you throughout this presentation and go through slides, but know that my style is to be more conversational. So you will have these slides. They are made available to you in a PDF. Um, and they're there for reference as we're talking. But we know that campus security authorities um, cover four main categories. And the most confusing we find with institutions is going to be officials with significant responsibility for student and campus activities. That is the broadest sense. And it's different from you know when someone's police or security. But when you get into areas like athletics, Greek life, in other areas, you want to make sure those people in those roles understand if they're a campus security authority. Because quite frankly, their function is going to determine what makes them a campus security authority. Do they have responsibility for student activities outside of the classroom? Um, and it's important that these people are trained because they are typically in the roles where students may disclose something or may ask for help um, in a situation. And they have to know what to do with that information, especially if someone is reporting a crime. Um, these are typically going to be the relationships that students are having with individuals, and they're going to come and seek help. Um, we know from Cleary Act program reviews that there are sometimes challenges with people who are serving as CSAs not passing information along. So you want to make sure you understand who is a CSA and that you're going through and identifying that on your campus. We also know there are certain roles that are not a CSA. So the most obvious is going to be people with privilege. So that's typically a medical doctor, counselors for student care, psychologists um, who are working in a counseling capacity. Faculty, so if a faculty is not serving as an advisor, they're typically not a CSA. Or support staff, so that could be clerical, maintenance, food service. Um, do know that at your institution, you can designate people CSAs even if they're typically someone who is not a CSA. So we know at an institution you are empowered to say everyone on our campus is a campus security authority. May not necessarily be the best idea to make sure that everyone, that to designate everyone a campus security authority because you may find, you may find out that you're getting rid of all the confidential help for students. Um, Making sure that CSAs know their CSAs through training. Um, training is something that comes up frequently. There is no federal guideline or federal mandate from the Department of Education to, to, do, to have a training or a length of a training. It gives you flexibility. Obviously, if you don't train them, and this is where we talk about the law being a starting point, if you don't train them, then they're likely not going to be able to perform their duties. So what you want to do is make sure that you're providing a way or a method to train people that makes sense. Um, we created a video. It's 15 minutes long. And the primary purpose of the film is to talk to resident assistants or your students who are acting as CSAs so that they understand what their obligations are as a campus security authority. Um, I mentioned that there are people who typically are not campus security authorities. I worked at a junior college where it made sense for the campus to designate faculty as campus security authorities. 
that may not make sense anywhere, but there, it, it did make sense in this capacity because we only had two student life staff, three public safety officers, and the relationship that students had with the faculty was very similar to the relationship that high school students have with faculty. So it made sense given the culture of the institution that we would move forward and make and train faculty to serve in a CSA capacity. And the main role of the CSA is to make sure that they pass on information that is reported to, you, to them. They don't need to investigate, and this is something that's really important to train people on. There is a program review from the Department of Education where a sexual assault um, by a male basketball player was made on a female basketball player. Female basketball player reported it to her coach. Female basketball coach talked to the male basketball coach, and they tried to work it out. Um, which we know in a Title IX world right now would not would necessarily would mean potential mediation. Um, know that a CSA is not responsible for determining what happened or to try to fix what happened or to try to solve the crime. Uh, it sounds silly to say, but it's a really important thing that you need to do. So it's something to consider when you're looking at CSAs. We talked about the exemption. Um, so looking again at those who fall as a counselor, typically. And when do we know? When do crimes need to be reported? So if a victim calls it to a CSA's attention. So even if the intention isn't to report it, if they tell you and you're a campus security authority, you have an obligation in real time to pass that information along to whoever is monitoring or handling Cleary at your institution, whether it's a Cleary coordinator, the assistant chief of police, whoever it is at your institution who's collecting that data. And then from there, they need to determine, obviously, it would be included in the Cleary statistics if it's in Cleary geography, and then evaluating it for a timely warning. This could also be if a witness or third party calls it to a CSA's attention. And remember, from that previous slide, it needs to be in good faith. So if it does come to their attention, you know, if there's a belief that it did actually occur. So information a CSA shares, um, the date and time of the incident, general location, and the description. Um, there may be a need to share more information um, based on other requirements. So for example, timely warning, if there needs to be the evaluation of a timely warning, or if the person reporting wants to have more information come forward. So these are things that we want to think about um, as you're moving forward and as you're training campus security authorities to take crime reports. So the CSA role is vital to compliance. Um, a lot of times I've heard it referred to as mandated reporting. I actually shy away from using that language. I think it makes people feel like they have to get it forward. Um, and our training around this really focuses on this. It's important for CSAs to know why they're doing this. Have it part of their job description. Have it part of your human resources onboarding to go forward. Give CSAs a one-pager with crime definitions in geographic area. Um, they don't need to be experts on what they are. And even um, emphasizing that they don't need to, if they're unsure, it's better to get it to public safety or campus police, and they can make that determination. There are a number of reporting forms and materials that you can use. Um, I have some of my emails at the end of this slideshow. If you're looking for any tools, that's something that we do at the Cleary Center is help institutions to um, better do their jobs or truly to institutionalize the work. And then the importance of timely reports. So the reports need to be timely um, in case there's a need to consider a timely warning or what needs to, what needs to happen next. So what do we want CSAs to know? When we're looking at training, start to think about why. What, what's the reason why? Where do they pass the information? When? This is really a summary of all that we've talked about in terms of how we're moving forward, how to get the information forward. So I know someone had asked, um, I'm not spo supposed to look at the questions, but I can't help myself sometimes. I saw a question come through asking the difference between a responsible employee and a CSA. And that's, our, that's the next thing we're covering. So Title IX, we know that Cleary is consumer protection law. So Cleary is about making sure we're getting information and we're making it available as well as policies. So reported statistics and policies at an institution. Title IX is civil rights law. So Title IX is dealing specifically with sexual harassment and sexual assault. 
And we know that with Title IX, some of the things we consider is a dis disclosure. So when someone tells about sexual violence without the intention of reporting, and quite frankly, those are the trickiest types of um, people coming forward because when someone wants to report and wants to take action, it's almost easy to provide them with steps moving forward. Whereas a disclosure, when you come forward with that type of information, sometimes the intention is you're telling, for example, your director of Greek life because you have a rapport with them, and you, ne you don't necessarily want to move forward. Um, and that's where there can be a challenge with CSAs and responsible employees. With responsible employees, responsible employees are actually um, under Title IX. They are designated to have to pass information to the Title IX coordinator, and we'll go through those three times when they do. And then there's the person with statutory privilege or person with confidentiality. So these are people who might take a report under Title IX, and then in moving forward, um, they may have some chat. They they do not have to move forward with the information. So a responsible employee. These are three step, three areas where they fall under responsible employees. It's going to be an employee who has the authority to take action um, to address harassment, employee who has a duty to report, and you'll see this, these use language like school because Title IX is K through 12 and higher education, whereas Cleary is higher education specific only. And then step three is an individual who a student believes has the authority or the duty. So these are the things that you're thinking about when you're talking about Title IX um, responsible employees and those pieces. Responsible employee reporting. Um, basically all relevant details about the alleged sexual assault um, that happens or sexual violence that the student or other person has shared. So that's information that will be going to the Title IX coordinator. It's going to be names of the alleged perpetrator, student who experienced the alleged sexual assault, other students involved in the sexual violence, um, and then any relevant facts that come into play. So those are types of things that you want to consider or look at when moving forward. Before a student reveals information, he or she may want to keep confidential. You want to make sure as a responsible employee, and you're telling the student as a responsible employee, that you have an obligation to report names of alleged perpetrators because they may have perpetrated in the past. There may be a risk to the community. Um, there's the option to request confidentiality, and then certainly the student's ability to share information confidentially. So these are all the things you want to consider and things you want to start talking about that you're looking on your campus and saying, who's a responsible employee? Do they know what their role is? Are they communicating it to students? How are you telling students who's a responsible employee and who's a campus security authority? And quite frankly, what does that mean when people act in those roles and what their obligations are? So the intersections, uh, and as I had mentioned, there was the question that frequently comes up is, OK, so what's the difference between a CSA and a responsible employee? So again, CSAs are giving non-personally identifiable information, nature, date, time, general location, current disposition. And the VAWA amendments to Cleary also give you some of the capacity to make sure you can keep information confidential. So if the location may identify a victim, you can withhold that. And all of this stuff with Cleary you can do with documentation. Documentation is important. There's accommodations that may be available to the person, um, as well as disciplinary proce proceedings. Um, Title IX. So you have responsible employees. Um, all relevant details uh, have to be shared. Sex discrimination, sexual harassment, sexual violence. So a little different. If it's a rape, it may fall both under Cleary and Title IX. Um, interim measures and grievous proceedings are things that are both put in there. So what are some of the co compliance challenges? So why is this selected as one of our top five? Well, quite frankly, what the Department of Education has found is that there have been inconsistent or non-existent underlying policies and practices. Um, the solution is have a webinar content to inform policies and practices. Um, work with your institution and make sure you're doing comprehensive training that works best for your institution, that takes into account what your institution's policies are. Um, failure to survey all campus security authorities. So uh, we have a sample CSA form, but using a sample form, having a form online, um, sometimes just simply Googling campus security reporting form, and you'll find one at other institutions. 
Um, and then the solution, you know, examples of possible practices and training for um, campus security authorities, there's a lack of training. And I see people talking about, um, you know, training and, and sharing model trainings. Make, put a training together. As I said, we have a film that we offer uh, for sale for institutions to license that they can purchase and make available to their students. Um, other institutions have made their own trainings. You can also look on YouTube. Sometimes there are trainings on YouTube. Um, we have sample slides that are at no charge that institutions can take and customize for, their, for what best serves their population. So there are a number of ways that you can think about what you need to do. So shall we uh, pause here for some questions, Allison? That sounds great. Tremendous. Uh, you are listening to uh, Campus Public Safety Online from the National Center for Campus Public Safety. And our guest today is Allison Kiss from the Cleary Center talking about top five challenges with the Cleary Act and Title IX. If you have questions or comments for Allison, type them into that line at the bottom of the box on the left side of your screen. And we will get to as many as we can over the course of the hour. Um, Allison Beth Eaton notes they have an ongoing issue and want to know if a student that is underage with other students of age who are in a dorm room but the underage student was not drinking, would you include the underage student drinking even though they weren't caught drinking? Yeah, so the underage typically with, it's going to be with alcohol with alcohol and drug and referrals for alcohol and drug, and, and we'll get to that a little later on as well. But with those referrals, there was a significant change from the handbook, from 2005 handbook for Krampus crime reporting to 2011 um, and then 2016. You want to look at anyone who is referred for disciplinary action. So who's on the report, who is referred. Um, and, and this has typically broadened. So it used to be you'd only include kind of those, if there were 10 students referred but five were drinking, only the five. But now you're adding the 10, so something to consider. Um, Stephen Doner wonders, are there any legal reasons preventing the Title IX office sharing information concerning their investigations that coincide with the university police department's investigation? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, are there legal reasons preventing the Title IX office from sharing information that concerns their investigation, that is the Title IX office, that happen mm -hmm. to coincide with the university police department's investigation? Sure. So that's not my specific area of expertise, but I know this has been a co the parallel investigation has been a comic topic that has been a challenge for institutions. And I'm happy, and it's it's nuanced. So there are certain things that come into play: public institution, private institution, um, how the processes are set up. So I'm happy. My contacts at the end. If I don't cover that later on, it's something that I'm happy to to talk online with the person specifically about because it sounds like it's going to be quite nuanced, nuanced depending on their institution. Um, let me squeeze in two more questions, and I'm going to combine these two. Uh, one question is, would you consider student escort patrol services, SEPs personnel as a CSA, and are trustees and university administrators mandatory reporters? So one of the things, the first was escort, so student escort. If, if they're responsible, if that falls into responsible for security or for public safety, um, that's something that you want to think about in terms of as a CSA. It sounds like they would be. It would be similar to someone who's monitoring the entrance to a residence hall or to a locker room. So do they have a, a responsibility for campus safety? It's something that you want to consider. And then the other question was, are trustees considered? Again, it's significant responsibility for student, um, for student activities or for activities outside of the classroom. So those are some things that you want to talk about. OK, well, hang on to the rest of the questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. But to keep you on your timeline, why don't I, let you, why don't I let you get back to your presentation? That sounds great. Um, and I do want to also say, I, I, I know that someone mentioned um, using our video, and they're sharing it. Just to know that when the video is purchased by an institution, it's actually licensed only for that institution. So just not to share that link publicly, because there is on our YouTube channel, on the Clary Center YouTube channel, there is a promo or a trailer for that video. But just want to encourage anyone who has it not to share that publicly, um, just because there are legal issues around that. Um, Okay, so we are going into timely warning and emergency notification as the next area to consider. 
Um, and something that we want to think about is language in the timely warning, the role of Title IX and the responsible employees in the timely warning process, um, and then some case studies, so ways to think about our case study to use it. And using case studies on your campus is a great way to think about timely warnings because it helps to kind of frame it and to put institutions in situations where you have to deal, deal with how you're making these decisions, what triggers a timely warning, how you're documenting your decision. So circumstances that trigger crime, timely warnings, um, it's going to be Clery Act crimes. So the crimes I mentioned um, in the first few slides, I said these are your Clery Act crimes. So the Clery crimes that are included in crime statistics, Reported to a CSA, so if something comes to a CSA or uh, local law enforcement, occurred in specific geographic areas, so on-campus, public property, non-campus, is it in a Cleary area, and then it represents a serious or continuing threat to students and employees. And those R's there don't mean that, it doesn't mean we're trying to trademark these. Um, those are there for you to know these are requirements. So these are the circumstances that come into play when you're considering or when you're developing a policy around a timely warning. Emergency notifications, I'm not going to spend as much time on. Emergency notifications were added to the Clery Act in 2008. Um, in 2008, when emergency notification was added to the Clery Act, the purpose was after the shooting at Virginia Tech, there was a desire to expand upon these requirements that you see here to include emergencies, to include illnesses, um, illness breakouts that might happen, weather emergencies. So it kind of expands beyond Clery and gives you the opportunity to segment an emergency that goes to a particular building on your campus or something in that nature. You don't want to merge um, timely warning and emergency notification policy. Even if it's the same process in your annual security report, you want to make sure that you have two separate policies, one for emergency notification and one for timely warning. In your warning policy, you want to specify who is responsible for issuing a timely warning. So often we'll see chief of police, emergency management per person. Um, you might see the Cleary coordinator. Uh, the Department of Office, and the consultation process. Um, I want to spend some time on this because what we often see or what we often hear, and this is where I'd rather be sitting face to face because I can often tell by people's faces, is you may have a timely warning policy. And I'll give you an example. I worked with a small institution in Pennsylvania. Timely warning policy was that the Director of Public Safety and the Assistant Director of Public Safety were responsible for determining if there was a current or ongoing threat and then issuing, uh, uh, issuing a timely warning in that case. As we talked through it, we were about to get up from the table and the Director of Public Safety said, oh, well, one time we issued an emergency, a uh, timely warning for a sexual assault that had happened. The president found out about it and was unhappy that we issued that timely warning because we had a lot of students coming to visit campus. Um, so she asked from that moment forward, anytime there's a sexual assault, that she be consulted before the warning goes out. So right there, the president is asking the director of public safety to violate his own policy. So you have to specify if there's a consultation process, and I'll editorialize a little bit by saying it's a bad idea <laughs> to have a consultation process because it can slow things down. But if you do have one, number one, make sure you're stating it in the policy. Number two, this is where we've actually worked with institutions where we've had to be the person coming in on a phone call or in a training explaining why this isn't a good process. If communications or admissions is worried about the way things are worded, then think about if you can pre-script some notifications to have specific information. But really, the people who are making these decisions, and that's typically public safety, security, police, need to be empowered to make that, to do that information and make those decisions. And if they're not, then having those conversations. Um, having open communication, so um, really making sure that information can, is, is going out um, pretty quickly. There's no time on timely warning, but you want to have a process, so you're putting things out, whether it be through text or through email or through flyers. And then case-by-case -case basis. Um, a lot of times people ask me, and it happened once earlier, will ask specific questions about Clery or Title IX, 
And the answer is it depends a lot of times because it's going to be nuanced. There are, are pieces that come into play of what your policy says. Um, are you following your policy? Um, it may depend on what you're documenting, on what information you're putting in, on the size of your institution, on your geography. So same thing with timely warnings. Sometimes people will say, there's a sexual assault on my campus. Do I issue a timely warning? Well, that's not enough. It's going to depend on, is there a current and ongoing threat? Is issuing a warning going to identify the victim? Um, these are things that you want to think about when you're making a policy. Uh, timely warnings have to be quick, so there's no time period. But you want to think about getting it out or having a process that could get it out as soon as possible. Community-wide, it has to reach your entire community. If you know that your students are not um, reading emails, uh, then you have to make sure you're putting it out in other modes. And then have information to aid in the prevention of similar crime. It's going to include information that promotes safety. Um, it should not identify a victim. And so often we'll say time, date, location. But there may be times that you can't include time, date, and location in there. Exempt cases. So we already talked about with campus security authorities exemptions, and here are more exemptions. You, anything reported to someone who's exempt is, tip, is typically not going to pass information on for a timely warning. So what are some myths? This is my favorite section. Um, I've heard a lot in the field, and I've seen in policies, institutions say, you know what, this last White House, um, the Obama White House, paid a lot of attention to campus sexual assault, so we must issue a timely warning for every sexual assault. That's a myth. If you have that in your policy, take it out. You have to evaluate. You can say you're going to evaluate every Cleary crime or every sexual assault for a timely warning, but you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into having to issue a timely warning for every sexual assault. It, rips the discretion out of this, and you have to make sure these are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the next myth is you have to include the location of a timely warning. That's also a myth. Um, you may want to withhold the location because it may identify the victim. It may be, you may be saying it happened in a residence hall, and then when Allison Kiss moves out of the fourth floor of that residence hall, it may indicate that Allison Kiss is a victim in that, in that case. That may be different. Where I said sometimes it depends. Um, some institutions have 50, what, 50 residence halls. So including the location may not identify that person. But these are things you want to think about. You must include details of the case. So um, I've seen timely warnings at institutions where it says, um, we referred to law enforcement. The student chose not to go through the student conduct process. These are things need to know to be in the know. And timely warnings, unfortunately, have um, turned into a need to know to be in the know. And you have to remember and remind your community, whether it's the student newspaper reporter, the local reporter, that timely warnings are need to know for safety, not need to know for community knowledge. Um, I can't tell you how many campuses I've worked with in trainings or on site where I've heard students are angry or faculty are angry that we were not told about this sexual assault. Um, you want to make sure that you're doing these just for safety. And then myth, you, need to, you do not need to include consultations. Wrong, wrong, wrong. If you, have to, if you have to consult with communications or the president's office, I'm happy to say on this webinar, and it's recorded, and you can replay it for them, that's not a good idea. It slows down the process. It takes away the discretion. But if you have to do that, you want to make sure you're including it in your policy. Otherwise, they're putting you in a position to potentially violate your own policy. Um, if you are not fully engaged in this webinar, I will say this is one of my favorite slides. So I, I think we use it quite a bit, and I think it's something that you can use as well. So what are the Department of Ed findings? Um, some of the Department of Education findings we've seen is failure to comply with timely warning requirement. So where institutions have, um, have not included a policy about this or something in their annual security report about this, um, or they're not doing what they'll say they'll do. Lack of adequate policy statements. We do annual security report reviews um, for our members at the Cleary Center. Um, I will say that I, I would say about half of the ones we did this year combined timely warnings and emergency notifications. Now, while we didn't delve too deep into emergency notifications today, you want to make sure that those are separate policies. 
have those as separate policy statements, even if you're doing the same thing for both. Um, and then some other common themes, distribution of the warnings, not coordinating CSAs, um, and as I mentioned, the inconsistent policy statements. So start with the basics. If you're overwhelmed, what's our approach to timely warning? Who's part of the team? Who's involved? Who isn't that should be involved? Um, another thing I constantly hear is that advocates do not like timely warning. Um, and I understand that because a lot of times when you have a victim advocate on campus or working with your campus, it may feel like need to know to be in the know. So that's where I mentioned need to know for safety only. Talk about how, you know, bringing in that advocate. Maybe they can help with tips that you're including. So they're not the tips just simply that say don't walk alone. Are you consistent? Are you consistent in your process? Are you documenting? You may have five reported sexual assaults. And for four of them, you may, you may say, well, um, we didn't issue timely warnings. You're going to want documentation showing why or do documenting why you didn't issue timely warnings. Um, a decision matrix is a great tool to use. Uh, we have one that we use for Campus Safety Awareness Month that's free. Um, that's modeled off of three institutions. Um, other institutions have them that you can look for. Using a decision matrix is a great way to model those. OK, let's see if we can get to some of these questions. Um, Christina wonders, if a CSA submits a crime statistic report and says the victim does not want police intervention or his or her name provided to anyone, but it is a VAWA offense, as the one responsible for query, would I have to notify Title IX? Great. So the question is, is a, is a, as a CSA, if someone moves that forward, well, you're going to want to consider, are you a responsible employee? Um, one of the challenges we've seen, or I've seen in working with Title IX and Cleary on campuses is sometimes the people working in Title IX and Cleary are not talking um, or are not working together. And the offices do have to work together. Um, often if you're a CSA, you're going to also, also be a responsible employee, not all the time. Um, the Title IX coordinator is a campus security authority, so everything that goes to the Title IX coordinator, if it's Cleary, is going to go to the Cleary person. Um, depending on the role of this person, if they are a responsible employee as well, then information may go to Title IX. And again, that's why it's so important to make sure students, there's communication with students about who's confidential. Because someone, while you may want to be acting in a confidential manner, you may not be able to, depending on your role. Question from Maria Weinberger. There are students who frequently wish to disclose, but do not wish to proceed, or are uncertain about proceeding. Yet we know that the requirement is that the entity must investigate, quote, if it knows or should have known, unquote. We've just been taking the investigation as far as we can without the participation of a disclosing student who does not wish to cooperate with the investigation. Any advice on that? Sure. I think there, there was good guidance in the 2014 from OCR, the FAQs, the Frequently Asked Question, um, that really kind of empowered institutions on when you're looking at a case, if you don't have, if the victim or the reporting party chooses not to move forward with it, evaluating campus safety risk. So there's no mandate that you have to move forward if you get the report if the student doesn't want to. The only kind of mandate per se is to look at campus safety risk. So have you heard that perpetrator's name before? Um, have you, do you know that he or she or they have a weapon, for example? Is there a risk in some way? So you want to look at that specifically. And I'm happy with whoever answer, uh, asked that question. I know that's a short answer, but I'm happy to share or pull that 2014 guidance and, and the exact paragraph and talk more in that, as I will with any of these questions. Squeeze in one more question for this break. Does the Clery Center video count toward the mandatory employee training to avoid the fines? Um, I do not, the mandatory employee training, I don't know if that is, that is something I'm not aware of in regulations. You can actually not train anyone. Um, it would not make sense to not train anyone because then they wouldn't know what their role is. So there is no, um, it, that, that's a myth if, some, if you're told that there's a two-hour requirement, a week-long training. You can actually, the Department of Education gives you some flexibility here where you can um, train however you want. Your trainings could be three minutes long if that's effective. Thanks, Allison. We'll let you get back to your presentation. Great. 
And so now we're on number three. Um, and I know we're together for an hour, but I can tell you that three, four, and five are not as in-depth as one and two. Um, confidentiality, so areas to consider. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we hear is around confidentiality. And my way to break it down is to quote Denzel Washington in um, Philadelphia and say, explain it to me like I'm a three-year-old. And by that, I mean when you're talking to students on your campus, simplifying it. Because sometimes we're living and breathing, and I remember from my campus experiences, um, serving on every committee possible, Monday was committee days, right, CERT, SART, um, CCRT, all of these committees, all of these nuances, making sure we're simplifying it for students. So thinking about a disclosure, what's going to happen if a student tells someone in student conduct, a faculty member, athletic services, health services, this is, I was responsible on the campus I worked at for pulling training or to do the training with institutions. And so really thinking about if that disclosure happens, um, do those entities know what to do? And that's how I started with my training need assessment. I would talk to the athletic director or some coaches and find out if someone told you that they were sexually assaulted or a victim of crime, what would you do? And then moving from there, if they couldn't answer that question, then I knew training needed to be done. So it's a great slide or visual to use when you're planning your training. Um, so some of the things you want to think about with confidentiality. Uh, VAWA in the Clery Act provided uh, more confidentiality in terms of thinking about victims on your campus. So thinking about publicly available record keeping, timely warnings, daily crime log, would include, without inclusion. So thinking about how you're including that without putting the personally identifiable information about the victim. What you may need to take out of that. Um, there's a campus we work with in their crime log where their local paper would try to identify who the victim was. And so they had to then, in their crime log, withhold certain information. And they were um, the selection for a Department of Education kind of spot check or audit or review. Um, and they passed a review because they had documentation of why they were withholding information from the crime log out of fear that it may identify the victim. So some of the things you want to think about with coordinated response. So how are you going to consider coordinated community response? Who's on your team? Who, who's working together? Cleary and Title IX, you need to have, we're working with a campus right now where the folks, the Cleary and Title IX team are robust. And many of you on this webinar are probably envious of that, especially those of you whose title is Cleary and Title IX coordinator. Um, and then there are some of you who are likely like Cleary coordinator, Title IX coordinator. I wish there was someone doing just those jobs. But again, I can't mention how many challenges I've seen with institutions where these two entities are not working together. There are certainly different laws and different compliance pieces, but there have to be those conversations. Um, a self-assessment, so checklist self-assessment. Um, we worked with the White House, the last administration, on an open source tool to assess. Um, I don't know if it's still public out there. If it's not, I can make it available. But it's a way to self-assess what you're doing and where there may be gaps. Um, collaboration we want to think about. And then table topping, so thinking about certain scenarios. For example, domestic violence is a Cleary crime. You may want to consider, if you have a report of domestic violence, does it make sense to put out a timely warning? Chances are domestic violence is a very dangerous crime to respond to. So if you put out a timely warning, it might put the victim in more danger. It may escalate the situation. So that's something that you want to think about when you're putting these pieces into play. Under Clery Act and Title IX, there are interim measures or accommodations, and I'm using the languages from the laws, that overlap. So you want to think about if it's a crime, so a sexual assault that may fall both under Clery and Title IX, how you're making sure to make that information available. Uh, the Clery Act now from 2013 in VAWA says you have to provide it in writing, uh, which is trauma-informed, quite frankly. So when you're explaining to a student who's reporting, all of their rights to request changes for academic, living, um, protective measures. You're also giving that to them in a piece of paper or in an email follow-up that's also letting them think about it a little bit. They may come forward three days later and want to make the change. Disciplinary process. So the Title IX process is sometimes um, the student conduct process. 
And then sometimes it's its own process. That's going to depend on your institution. But you'll see that a lot of the language is similar. So Clery Act addresses specifically the student conduct process as prompt, fair, and partial. And you'll see similar language in the Title IX for the grievance procedures, which again, the Title IX process could be the student conduct process, um, unless obviously it's not a student, then it may be outside. Clery requires saying what um, the standard of evidence is uh, versus the and Title IX says preponderance in the guidance we have now. As we know, that could potentially change with subregulatory guidance. Clery just simply says an institution has to disclose the standard. Um, both require training, but there's not prescriptive of the training. So I think the last uh, negotiator rulemaking session, and I know I think Mike Webster is on this webinar. He was part of negotiator rulemaking with me. Um, the Department of Education was very specific not to specify or prescribe what an annual training is. Um, it more kind of offers the people who are hearing he hearing hearings or hearing cases have to be trained. So you do have flexibility in what kind of training you're putting together. And there's a lot of creative ways that you can do that. Um, I think county rape crisis, domestic violence organizations are underutilized. Building those partnerships, supporting them, I think that often what you can pay your local center um, to provide those services will be invaluable for all the work that they can do for you and the information they can give you. And I address the writing information as well a little bit. You want to make sure you're building, make sure you know what your on and off campus services are. Training and education. So we talked actually throughout this webinar about CSAs and responsible employees. And um, as I mentioned, we do have a training. Um, I, I have resources if anybody wants to talk online. You know, some are for costs that you can license at your institution, and then some are free. So we do have some kind of baseline webinars that you can take and adapt for your institution. We worked extensively with Penn State after um, 2011 when um, uh, an external party filed the first Clery Act complaint. We actually worked with Penn State to create a training that works for them or that helps them um, that help them uh, train their employees around this. So we have model slides from that. Um, they did a video as well. Uh, if you have a film department or video department, um, it's something that you can do creatively to kind of move forward or go from there. Um, student and employee programs. So. Um, thinking about how you can engage students and employees uh, around these issues. So some of the things that we heard from the Cleary regulations was prior the 1992 Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights required that we do training on sexual assault. And that was actually expanded to say, you know what, if you're going to do something, evaluate it, see if it works. And so the regulations, you know, require that you're evaluating your training, that you're doing ongoing training. And there are things like primary prevention and awareness that were mentioned in the rulemaking sessions, as well as bystander intervention and risk reduction. And these are all important things to think about when you're putting together training. Bystander intervention will not work everywhere, but it works quite well from the research at multiple places. So really thinking of what works best for your culture. Some of the trainings with Title IX, um, things that you can think about, uh, there are online trainings, some at cost, and uh, again, some free trainings. Uh, the One Love Foundation has a domestic violence or dating violence training film that is free of no cost. Um, the Cleary Center, we worked with five institutions all over the country on PACT-5, uh, P-A-C-T-5, the number five, which was these institutions uh, producing films around campus sexual assault. Some are great, some are not as great, but maybe there are ones in there that you can use for trainings. And these are things that are free. Um, working with your local center, your local domestic violence sexual assault center, I think these, again, um, my career started at one of those centers, and I couldn't believe how hard it was to go in and provide free training. So I think it's really important to continue to provide free training and, and that type of thing. Um, for institutions and to look and to be resourceful and see what you can find because I do know and I'm very sensitive that some of you have no budget um, that will cover these types of things. Okay, let's see how many of these uh, questions we can cover in the few minutes we have left. Uh, LaShawn wonders, please share any considerations for sworn versus non-sworn officers on college campuses with Cleary. 
Um, for sworn, I mean, Cleary applies to all campuses, so regardless if they are sworn or unsworn officers. Um, I think in terms of how your campus is working, there's no requirement. Um, you have to certainly reach out to local law enforcement and get their statistics as well, but you may want to think about a memorandum of understanding if it's possible. Um, if you have unsworn or, or even with sworn officers on campus, I think it's something that's um, that's valuable for your institution to have, but there's nothing specific to Cleary that, I mean, you just need to indicate in your annual security report the type of public safety or security um, that you have. Jerry Lottie wonders, why do the timely warning and emergency notification policies need to be separate policies? Yeah, because there, and this is one of those technical elements. We often say we talk about the technical elements of Cleary and um, the technical elements and then also the spirit of the law. These are one of those technical elements. They're listed as two separate regulations. Um, so you want to think, you have to think of it as, uh, as separate. So it needs to be a separate piece, even if it's the same. From Matthew Billis, would a reported date rape pose enough of a continuing threat to necessitate a timely warning? Um, it, it depends. Again, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm staying true to, true to action here. It's really going to depend um, on the institution and um, how you're evaluating it. Uh, some have quoted David Lisak, the serial perpetrator, serial predation study, as a reason to always, um, to always issue, uh, issue timely warnings. But quite frankly, to me, that's not enough. You need to evaluate each situation. Other than personally identifying information for students, are there any other aspects of a query crime that may be withheld from a public records request? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, other than personally identifying information mm -hmm. about a student, are there, other, yeah. are there other aspects of a Cleary crime that may be withheld from a public records request? Um, I actually, I think that's going to, again, depend on, obviously, it's going to be a public institution you're dealing with there. That's not my area of expertise. So in terms of what you have with Cleary, I mean, what's available with Cleary is there. In terms of, that sounds like more of a police record issue, um, which goes beyond specifically uh, the Cleary piece. From Suzanne, we are currently uh -huh. reviewing our, our responsible employee policy and are having a very hard time convincing staff that they should report all incidents told to them by the Title IX coordinator. Staff feel they have a special relationship with their students and don't want to ruin that relationship. How can we mandate that staff comply without violating their staff-student confidentiality? Right, um, and I think that therein lies the problem, or the challenge, I shouldn't say problem, the challenge that we see with institutions. Um, it's a matter of, I mean, I think these are the organizational challenges that sometimes happen too. Um, and, you know, simply coming out and mandating you have to do this will likely not work. Uh, sometimes it's going to be a longer process. Um, trying to get an advocate for, uh, Trying to get an advocate for what you're doing and for your work is important. Um, at my institution, it was the business school. Anyone in the business school, I was, and I was actually told going into it, the business school is not going to help you. They do their own thing. So it was a three-month process until I can find that advocate who got it and who understood and who could be the voice in there. So I think anyone you can engage from those areas on your Cleary committee or on your uh, campus committee is going to be one that can help you um, to, to make those or to make the case that you need to make. Um, last question we're going to get in. For institutions who have programs abroad, what is the recommendation for training for CSA and Title IX? Yeah, again, there's not, um, there's not a specific recommendation. So I think it's how are you going to get the information across to them? If you do, um, if you do something that is five hours long, are they not going to watch it? So what is best for them? Is it going to be a one page or is it something that simply explains to them how to move forward? Is it a way you can do a WebEx or some type of webinar for them? I think those are the things that you need to consider. I'm also including in the chat box um, a link to Changing Our Campus, which is an OVW website. I know that some questions came up as well for CSAs and victim advocates, and that's a hot topic right now. Um, if you click on that Changing Our Campus 
along the scroller on the top, there is guidance that was vetted both by the Department of Education um, and by the Department of Justice attorneys looking at guidance for victim advocates on your campus as CSAs. So these are people who don't necessarily have counseling licenses, but they may have state privilege. I will also tell you coming down the pike, we're looking at doing a focus group around this because it's a topic where the Department of Education likely needs more information, um, especially because um, some states have pretty uh, sta provide statutory confidentiality to victim advocates, and that has been a challenge. But I, I think that document might be a good help to start for some of you who ask those questions. But thank you so much, Steve, for moderating the questions and bringing them in. It's been very helpful. And thanks very much, Allison. And thanks to all of our viewers and questioners from around the Internet. Check the NCCPS webinars page for a link to the captioned recording of today's presentation, as well as a link to our speaker slides. The brief evaluation survey I mentioned earlier should already be in your mailbox. It will take you no more than two minutes to complete. Please do. We read and act on your comments. Mark your calendars for the next Campus Public Safety online webinar, 2 to 3 p.m. on Tuesday, August 15th. Our speaker will be Morning Fox, Deputy, De Deputy Commissioner of the, of the Vermont Department of Mental Health, and he'll be discussing violence prevention and de-escalation of emotionally charged situations. The registration URL is on your screen and clickable, or surf on over to the National Center webpage at nccpsafety.org. That's nccpsafety.org. The National Center for Campus Public Safety is now offering the second year of its extremely popular Trauma-Informed Sexual Assault Investigation and Adjudication Institute at a number of locations from coast to coast. The groundbreaking curriculum was developed in collaboration with nationally recognized subject matter experts and includes modules on 15 topics from the effects of trauma to interviewing. The schedule for upcoming dates and locations is on your screen. For more details and to register, click the blue link or visit our webpage. Campus Public Safety Online is brought to you by the National Center for Campus Public Safety with support from the University of Vermont Continuing and Distance Education and the U.S. Department of Justice. Special thanks today to Megan O'Neill. This is Steve Warona. See you next time on Campus Public Safety Online. <laughs>